I'm Sam Connell. I'm one of the librarians at New Canaan Library. We're so delighted to have you here today with Karen Antonini, who um, one of our resident chef instructors. She's going to show us how to make some lovely recipes today. So today but we're starting a two-part series on um, Italian cuisine. For today, we're going to focus on Roman cuisine. And next month, we're going to focus on the cuisine of Northern Italy. Um, please go to newcanonlibrary.org and you will be able to register for that. You just want to click on the events calendar and you can register for next month's event as well. So today, Karen's going to show us um, a delicious Roman meal from antipasta to dessert and uh, we'll learn how to create these beautiful Italian dishes. I know a lot of you guys are asking about the recipe. If you received the email with the Zoom link, you have the recipe. It is in the same email. You just wanna to scroll to the bottom of your reminder email, either from this morning or yesterday, and you'll see the full recipes there. So I also wanted to introduce Karen to everyone. I know we have a lot of new people joining us here today. Um, Karen, through her global experiences, multiple languages and cooking skills, brings the world to our table with quick and easy recipes, tips, and ideas. She grew up surrounded by friends and guests from overseas, sparking a lifelong interest in languages, cultures, and travel. Both in her travel, excuse me, both in her childhood and later in life, she traveled extensively, living abroad during her global entrepreneurial enterprises and cultivating recipes. Her lifelong passion for cooking and baking was put to test during the COVID lockdown, and she has since built a lifestyle brand around these endeavors. You can visit her at the website, Cultivated by Karen. She's a regular on-air contributor, host, and producer of a 30-minute cooking show, uh, The Town Dish, which is a series honoring first responders in New Canaan. So we're very lucky to have her here today. Hi, Karen. How are you? Hi, Sam. I'm great. I'm so excited to make this meal today. <laughs> We've got a lots of great stuff. So we will jump right in if that's all right. So, okay, welcome everybody. Today, I'm going to be making some crispy baby artichokes, which are in season. I have to say, even in the last few weeks, they've become better and better. So we'll be making that. And then some, some carbonara, the authentic way the Italians make it in Rome and then some gelato, some vanilla gelato. So, so to get started, you, for the baby artichokes, you're gonna need about 10 to 12 of these little baby artichokes. I was able to find these. It's a little bit early in the season, but like I said, over the past few weeks, I found that they're ramping up. Um, so I found these at Walter Stewart's and these look really, really good. So I am heating up my pot of oil I'm actually using some olive oil in here. You know, usually you can use a uh, vegetable or canola or another kind of oil, but I'm using olive oil because it brings out this really amazing flavor, like kind of a nutty flavor with the artichokes. So I've gone ahead, I've been heating that up. I have a lot of things on the stove today I'm heating. So <laughs> I have to remind myself. Um, and I have a plate lined with paper towels because we are going to be, keep that there. We are going to be making these crispy, frying them in that olive oil. So I have some lemons as well. I'll show you what I've done so far. I filled a little bowl with some cold water and I've sliced a lemon. You can add a little bit more. I've just juiced that lemon right into the water. And then I just put, I don't know if you can see this, I just put the lemons right in there. So this helps to fight the little artichokes prevent them from becoming browned. So I probably started these, I don't know, half an hour ago. And as you can see, they're nice and light green, no brown. So that's what it should look like. And I'm gonna show you. So I'm gonna start peeling these. So what you wanna do is just peel off the outer layer until it gets to that nice bright green that we just saw. So I'm gonna go ahead, open my garbage. Whoops, <laughs> splattering things all over already. Um, and then just keep peeling off this outer layer until you get to that nice tender center. So you'll see it kind of changes pretty quickly with a baby artichoke. 
which is really nice. And then you're just gonna also slice off the very end of, whoops, just the tip. So you're removing this bit and then actually I'll trim off. If there's anything that didn't get trimmed, just trim that off with a really sharp knife. And I'm also going to just take, you can see the very tips of the artichoke. I'm just gonna slice that off as well. It just, you don't want any little pointy pieces when you go to eating your little artichokes. So there we go, I think a couple more and that is a nice bright green. So I'm gonna pop that in there with my others. You can see this is a great, these are just great. So I'm really excited, ready for some spring veggies, produce and in the weather. Today's a little, little cooler, but we're getting there. Okay, so I'm gonna keep an eye on my, my oil. So with olive oil, it tends to splatter a little bit more. That's why I'm using a higher pot today. You can use a, a pan if you're brave, but I, I like to keep it safer <laughs> with my high walled pot like that. There we go. A couple more. And then I'll show you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna turn that up a little, make sure it's hot enough and clear some of these guys out. This is actually a great dish. These are otherwise known as Jewish artichokes or carciofia la Judea uh, in Rome. They were really, really made popular or it was really a necessity whenever the, the food and water were scarce. When the Jews historically were in the ghetto, these artichokes were actually really plentiful, which is very interesting. So they were able to fry them and make these incredible, these little baby artichokes. And today it's become really a specialty and one of the most well-known dishes in Rome, which is kind of really special. So here we go. Chop off the tips. It was so good and so, so kind of indicative of, of Rome. So if you do get over there, you just make them yourself, you'll get over there one day and try these. I highly recommend it. You can also use larger artichokes for this dish, but you will just have to peel a little bit further because they're definitely tougher and cook them a little bit longer. So let's see, this guy, yeah, it's pretty hot. Okay, Karen, can so- you, yes. Karen, can you let us know how much olive oil did you put in the pan for the artichokes? I, yes, I think I put about two to three cups. Uh, you might not need that much because you're flipping them over. So, but if you're making, you know, 10 to 12, use about two or three cups of olive oil. And you can use a, a lighter olive oil if you want or something not as expensive. It doesn't need to be you know, a high quality because we are cooking in it. So that, that helps a little. I know it's, it's more expensive than other cooking oils, but it definitely makes a difference. Okay, so now I'm not gonna put this guy in. It doesn't need to be in there. It's just if you're prepping ahead of time, you would definitely want to keep your lemon, your nice lemon water. So now what I'm going to do is just cut these guys right in half. And you're gonna to wanna to just kind of splay out the leaves. Hopefully you can see what I'm doing here. Make it a little mess. Cause it'll look really pretty when they're all crispy and fried. And if you feel anything that's a little bit tough, that wasn't really, but I'm just saying, if you feel something that's like a little bit tougher on the outer edge, you can just peel it right off. But once you get to that light green, you should be totally fine. So let me see, yeah, this should be fine. Now, the other thing is when these have been in the water, you're just going to want to, I'm gonna put some towels down. This guy's okay, he was not in the water, but just kind of blot them a tiny bit if they need it. You can wring them out with your hands. Oops, okay, that oil is hot, that's good. Okay, just wring them out a little bit because you don't want that in the water and just blot them. There's not a lot that collects, so it's pretty easy. Let's see, a couple more. All right. 
And you can put these in, once you put them in, I may just start plunking them in there because you may have to do this in batches. That's gonna splatter. Um, it's nice and hot. So you might have to do it in batches because you don't wanna overcrowd your pan. So I'm gonna go ahead, just gonna start putting some of these guys in there. Let's see, I'm gonna put them in with A. I have my splatted spoon, but A is definitely hot. It always takes a while for my, uh, my stove top to heat up, so I to get it going. And then just watch them, probably about three or four minutes or so. And then you'll turn them just so they're nice and golden crispy. Get your little leaves out. And you do want it nice and hot so that they don't, they really fry up nicely. Whoops. And they don't fall apart in there. Karen, can you let us know what temperature you recommend for the oil? It was about 280. I didn't use a thermometer today, but about 280 and that uh, 280 degrees. So that way it's hot. I'm gonna flip some of these guys. Yeah, it's kind of crowded. So let's save some of these. Now I'm gonna flip them. They're looking really good. Yeah, you just don't want them to burn. So you just kind of keep an eye and there you go. And then I have my plate, like I said, I'm gonna keep these guys for later. So we have time for everything today. We have so many things, delicious things. I'm gonna put my plate, that way it just kind of drains out the excess oil, of course, on this paper towel. And I just keep, let them, Sit for about three or four minutes and then check because they are babies. <laughs> so you want to make sure yeah, I don't want to overcrowd my pan. So I'm going to let these, I'm going to keep these guys aside for later. And back in there. Okay. We are going to make sure to heat up my water while I'm doing that for my pasta. Okay, there we go, and we are getting there. And afterwards, what you can do is just add a little bit, turn this up a little more, add a little bit of just some lemon and sea salt. And it's just, just as easy as that, they are so good. There we go, a couple little wedges of this lemon. Even these lemons look so good today. Everything's so bright. Maybe when the sun's out, so much nicer. Come on, guys. Okay. okay. So I'll leave those alone. And while those are frying up a little bit, I'm going to explain the next dish and then I'll, I'll keep peeking on them though. So I'm heating up my water. I have, I don't know if you can see this, but anyway, it's just a large pot of water for the pasta, just normal for my spaghetti. And of course you wanna go ahead and salt it, generously salt that pot. So it's salty like to see. And for that dish, I'm going to need, so I'm making the carbonara, I'm going to need two large eggs, two egg yolks, of course, my pound of spaghetti, some pecorino cheese. This looks so amazing. And my pancetta and some olive oil to cook the pancetta. So I'm going to get that started in just a minute. Let me check on these guys. We're getting there. We're getting nice and crispy. Almost, a couple of them are almost ready. I give them a different 
slightly different stages. So let's see. I'm going to try to, I don't think you can see this off hand. So I'm going to off camera, I'm going to, hoping those would cook a little bit faster. Like that's okay. We're, we're okay so far. So basically to start that dish while we're waiting, I'm going to add in, I'm going to use a pan like this and I'll tell you why, instead of a, a large saucepan for, to, for the carbonara is because if I'll show you the pan I sometimes use, but I'll tell you why I'm not going to use this. Basically, we're going to boil our pasta, cook it just according to pasta, the package instructions. And then you're going to put it right in here once the pancetta has cooked. But it's a little bit trickier with tossing the eggs and the cheese at the end. So it's a little bit easier if you don't do it a lot to use a higher pan. Let's stick this here. OK, too many things. <laughs> So that's why I'm opting for this because you can really top, make sure to toss your pasta and you wanna add that cheese slowly. I'll show you all that, of course. Here's one. One guy is out and ready. Okay, we're getting there. Okay. So I'll do a couple of these so we have time for everything else, but you'll get the idea. So once these are drained, you can lightly, gently press on them, add a little bit of your lemon and sprinkling of sea salt, and they're so good. You might want to wait a second. <laughs> They'll be a little bit hot, but, but serve them immediately once they've come out. Give them a, a couple minutes and then go ahead and serve them. They are really good. Just about done. Another little guy. So you can see. So it takes just a few minutes in this pot and they are delicious. You can use other little dips if you want, but really the way that they're eaten in Rome is kind of just like this traditionally. So you got a little crispy and you can remove it to crispy some of the edges, but there we go. All right, so I'm going to put this aside. Hopefully they don't all burn to a crisp. I'm going to put this aside so we can get going with, with our other dishes. Move that. Okay, so I'm going to wait a second and oh, that's not too hot. Okay, go ahead. And I'm going to add my olive oil. Let me just get some of this up. A little bit of the splatter. There we go. Okay, so I'm gonna add my, you want two tablespoons of olive oil in your pot. And that's already, that's already hot. So cooking your pancetta, you're gonna want about a low to medium heat. So come on, olive oil. There we go. And of course the pancetta has fat, it is fat. So you don't need too much, but this is a slow drizzle today. It's not finding its, its pace, but just enough to really coat that pancetta because you are gonna put the pasta directly in this pot as well. So let me just grab those remaining, remaining guys so they don't burn to a crisp. We can eat those later. Okay, there we go. So heating this up, I'll just wait a second for the oil to heat up. And my other pot is hopefully gonna be hot <laughs> by the time we get to that. Get the pasta, as soon as it's boiling, I'm gonna put the pasta in. So move this out of the way actually, so I can show you. Okay, so we have our pound of pasta here waiting, getting the oil heated. And then you're just gonna add your pancetta right in there. And then just cook it till it's just crispy, just a little bit crispy. That adds so much flavor. There's not many ingredients in this dish. Let's see, get my spoon. So 
you want, and you're going to want to try to find the freshest eggs that you can. It will, they will be cooked, of course. We're also making the gelato later. So if you're doing this whole recipe, you definitely want really, really fresh. Let's get some of that out of the way, some fresh eggs. So let's go, come on. It's going to cook. Okay. There we go, and our pecorino cheese. So I'm gonna go ahead and grate that when, while I'm waiting. It's always waiting for this, this burner. So we're gonna need about a cup of pecorino cheese. So pecorino is a sheep, it means pecorino means little sheep, and pecora means sheep in Italian. So this is a great, really kind of nutty, buttery taste of this cheese. There it goes. It's just, this is actually what they use in Rome, pecorino. You can also use, you can swap it out and use Parmesan if you like, if you prefer the flavor, it's no problem. So pecorino is really, most of the pecorino is made actually in Sardinia. And then in some areas like Lazio, which is the area where Rome is and parts of Tuscany, like Siena, where they can be called uh, pecorino manufacturers. So I'm going to do about a cup of this as we're making about about four servings with this pasta. Karen, can you take a quick question? Sure. Diana wants to know what can be substituted for our pancetta. Did I say that right? Well, yes, you did. Yes, you did. You can, you could use bacon. Um, it's the difference between the pancetta and bacon is that pancetta is un, it's unsmoked and uncured where bacon is cured and smoked generally, but you could, if you, you know, you couldn't find it. I mean, you can generally find this. I found it, I don't know about Acme, but definitely Walter Stewart's, um, Trader Joe's, there's A&S, um, specialty markets have it as well. So, but you could, you could definitely use a bacon in a pinch. It's gonna give you a slightly different flavor, but absolutely it doesn't, it's, it's still gonna be really tasty. Okay, so that is going, let's get this, hopefully this water, <laughs> I might have to switch out this burner. Let's see how this water is going. Or we jump into the uh, gelato, okay. It's a large pot of water. So it takes, I did turn it on before we started, but it'll get there. I won't watch it. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna do a little bit more of the cheese, about, about a cup, but, and then you can use a little bit extra if you want at the end for serving, it's up to you. There we go. Okay, so I'm gonna put this aside. And put the cheese there. Okay, so I'm gonna reserve this for now. Put this over here, see how my pancetta, just until it is definitely getting crisp. So I'm going to actually set this aside. That pot of water is not, it is not cooperating. So I'm actually gonna switch it over to this burner. And then let's see, I'm gonna make the, I think in the interest of time, I'd like to try to make the gelato while we're doing this. So I'm gonna put, this one seems to work a little bit faster. <laughs> but I'm gonna do that, turn this guy off. Okay, I'm just gonna get, I'm gonna get something to put that pan on. Okay, lots of things so we can do this. So I don't need that. Okay. So while that is boiling, hopefully that goes quickly. I'm going to show you the gelato so that we have time for everything today. So what you're going to need for the gelato is three cups of whole milk. Definitely use whole milk and don't use skim milk or anything else, just whole milk and don't use cream. The reason why is that the Italians use milk in their gelato 
because it creates a more intense flavor. So like in American ice cream or other kinds of ice cream, the, they use the heavier, the fat. So they use a cream. And what happens is it kind of coats your tongue. It tastes really, really good. But whereas like the milk will not coat your tongue as much because it doesn't have as much fat content. So the flavors are much more intense. And you'll see that when you make this. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm actually gonna bring this to a boil. And I'm gonna put this here. This guy better hurry up. Okay. So I'm gonna bring this to a boil and just make sure to watch the milk and maybe give it a stir. I'm gonna bring in my ingredients now for the gelato. Just like put the, everything over here. Okay, so I could separate that and show you what we need. Okay. So I have, let's see, I'm bringing that to a boil. I have my wooden spoon and I like to just, just stir my milk, just make sure, give it a stir as it, you're bringing it to a boil every once in a while, just to kind of make sure it's not sticking to the bottom. I love using this kind of enamel based um, little saucepan because it helps to, so it doesn't stick as much. And the reason we're also using the wooden spoon is at the end, when we put all the ingredients together, the way you know that the gelato base is ready is because you'll get a nice coating on the back of your spoon. So that's what I'm gonna use. You'll need about three quarters cup of super fine sugar. I'm using su la la, super fine because it actually dissolves faster and it's, it's just much creamier. It's a nicer blend in your gelato. So it looks like this. It's definitely um, a little bit, it's not harder to find, but sometimes they're out, but you can find it at one of the markets for sure. Absolutely. I always keep a couple of these on hand in case a recipe like, a, I don't know, sometimes a, a tart or something will call for something that uh, the super fine sugar, because it dissolves better. So I just wanted to show you that. So I've got about three quarters cup and I've reduced, you can even go down to like half a cup if you want, if you don't want it quite as sweet, but I found about three quarters. I mean, I'm judging for my boys who will probably eat any of it. So, <laughs> but that is um, about three quarters cup of the super fine is what we generally use. So let me move this out of the way. This guy does not want to boil today. Um, and then I'm going to take a uh, strainer like this, a very fine mesh strainer and an extra bowl, which we'll use at the end. And I will show you that in some vanilla, which I'll add, I'm gonna keep it there. So I have my vanilla, it is, or my milk is heating up, sorry. And I'm going to take a blender and show you, I've already put six egg yolks in a pan like this. You just want the egg yolks. And then again, just use really the freshest eggs you can find. And I'm going to add my super fine sugar right in with the egg yolks. And then just beat it till it's blended, maybe a little bit light. Let's see. So it's well blended in here. So it's just blended. It's a little bit nice, bright yellow. Again, great colors for spring. And I'm gonna take these feeders right out of here. So I don't need that. The only time you need it is just for that, to blend the eggs. Okay, come on water. Let's see, starting to boil. And once that milk is boiling, we're gonna add that in a thin stream to the gelato. Okay, so I'm gonna, I don't want him to, I want him to boil. <laughs> so I'm gonna put this aside just for a minute because I can see that the milk is not, you can test the milk with your pinky finger. I mean, you'll see it boiling for sure, but once you know it's getting a little bit hotter and then like I said, just 
give it a nice little stir every once in a while. Okay, so that looks good. All right, and let's see, maybe I will show you these. We might actually have time for the biscotti if I didn't think we would have time for this since this is not boiling. Nothing is happening fast enough here today. So, I am do, you, show you. do you want my two cents? <laughs> do you, sure. Do, do you mind if I interject? Um, no. Please. Covered pot boils. Covered pot. Ah, uh, yeah. Much faster. Thank you. Yes. Know. Yes. This one, for some reason, one of these burners is so slow. I'm going to put it on here too. Um, and then there's just a lot oh, of conversation about about sugar but i think we've handled it in the chat super fine is interchangeable with castor sugar it is not interchangeable with powdered sugar also mm -hmm. known as 10x also known as icing sugar do not use powdered sugar for the recipe no do not use powdered sugar and you know in a pinch you could use normal sugar it's not really going to change it but you know it just it's it's much better to use the super fine if you can so it's not, it will be perfectly fine if you can't find. Okay, so that is getting there. Yeah, I can hear it going. Okay, so I'm gonna show you the biscotti because I don't think we'd have time for the entire, let's see, entire recipe. And this is on my website. So if you want to make these, these are absolutely delicious cookies to go along with really anything. Um, I'm gonna show you what they look like. They're really, easy to make. So they look like this. They're just these little round, delicious citrus cookies. So what I've done is, because I know, of course, he's going to boil. Um, so what I've done is I've had, I've used a half a cup of butter, half a cup of sugar, just normal sugar, one egg, some flour. Again, this is all the measurements are on my website if you want to make these. And the secret ingredient here is the orange, the zest of the orange. It really brings out this incredible flavor with these cookies. And what I like is that when you create something so tasty like that, you don't need a lot. It's like, you're just satisfied. I mean, it's hard to not eat more, but you can be satisfied with just one or two, which is really nice. So anyway, this is on my website. What you do need to do once you make the batter is to then wrap it like I've done in saran wrap. And then I like to put it in a clean tea towel and so it doesn't lose its shape in the fridge and then just put it in there for at least a couple hours. And what's great is you can do this a few days ahead of time. And then you can like literally slice and bake this, which is really nice. And you bake it for only about 10 to 12 minutes, depending on your oven, it's getting there. And you've got this amazing, it's just amazing cookies. So this can also complement your, your meal. Okay, I think this, the milk is actually, let's see, keep that on there, I hear it. Hear a point, then we'll go back to the, to the gelato once the, uh, yep, it's starting to so We have to boil. a question for you while those things are yes. heating up. So, yeah, I'm gonna get some um, water. There was a question about the artichokes. And I'm wondering if it's more about stuffed artichokes versus the fried artichokes you're making. But somebody mm -hmm. was asking such a great question about the etiquette of eating artichoke. Um, Cause I know it's a little tricky with the stuffed artichokes, I know. but <laughs> I feel like with your fried artichokes, it might be a little bit more straightforward. Can you talk to us a little bit more about that? Yes. Well, I, I think with the, definitely with these fried artichokes, you just eat them. I mean, they are, you know, a little bit messy, they're, they're crispy. So you eat them just like, kind of like chips. I mean, you just pop them in your mouth and they should kind of dissolve <laughs> in your mouth. I think with artichokes, I mean, stuffed or, you know, if you're using a larger artichoke and you're dipping it, um, that there's really no way around it. I don't think you can even use like a fork, uh, a, a fork and knife because it's just, that's how you eat them is just dipping them and I think this is actually, uh, but yeah, fork and knife. There's actually another dish. There's another um, artichoke dish, which I, I don't think, I don't know if I'll make it the next time, but it, you actually put it in the oven and that you would definitely use a fork and knife. It's just very straightforward and you bake those and they're really good too. So, okay. I think his, 
that's boiling enough. Let's go. <laughs> Let's get this going. Okay, I'm going to throw this in. I hope that answered your question. If it didn't, it did. It's great. And it kind okay. of, it sounds okay. like artichoke can be really great fork and knife food, but also very casual gathering type of finger food. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to, yeah, absolutely. That's why this one's kind of fun. It's just, it's easy, casual, kind of like tapas all that easy, it's easy things you eat with your fingers. Okay, I'm just gonna just set the timer for that. Let's see, my stopwatch, there we go. Okay, and I think this milk is, it is boiling, perfect. Something is actually working today on <laughs> the stove top. Okay, so move that over a little bit. So this is boiling. You'll just see the bubbles, you know, just a normal boil. And then what you're gonna wanna do is add this to, sorry if you can't really see this, I'm going to swap out this pan, just turn it down a little bit, this saucepan with where the milk was. So I'm going to add the milk. This is, remember, the eggs and the sugar, the egg yolks and the sugar. Might wait just a second. It's pretty hot. And I'm going to add, can you all see this? I hope. Add this milk in a steady little stream. So a steady stream and then just mix it in. Oops, looking at that. And mix. So just gonna blend with my egg yolks and sugar. And then I'm just gonna stir this over. I've turned down that burner. You don't want this to boil. Once the milk is in there, you do not want the egg, egg, sugar, milk to boil, but you want it to just get thick enough. I know it's going to go quickly, this part, which is great. You want it thick enough that it's going to coat the back of this spoon. And then I will show you, as I told you before, the beauty of the spoon, the wooden spoon, is that you can see when it is ready. So you just keep stirring that, keep stirring it constantly. I'm actually going to give this guy stir this too all right get the spaghetti is finally going okay and let's see get this milk and this doesn't take too long this part of it once it kind of coats the spoon you just want to keep an eye there maybe three four or five minutes then you're gonna transfer it to strain your, your bowl and the strainer. So once you've done that part, let's see, is it getting, it's getting there. I'll be patient, it's just patience today. So once you've done that, if you don't have an ice cream maker, it's totally fine. I'm gonna reach over here as I'm stirring. And you can use a glass dish like this to pour your gelato into. Or if you do have an ice cream maker, you are just gonna follow these instructions that I'm giving you today for the gelato, the base. And then you're gonna put it in your ice cream maker and just use those instructions on how to actually cool it and make your gelato. So it's pretty easy. Mine takes about, once I put it, I do have an ice cream maker. I will put it in this kind of container it has a little paddle that goes around, spins around in the top, and it takes about maybe 25 to 30 minutes. And then I will also just put it in a container, which I will show you. Found some awesome containers. Okay. So this is this mixture now. My little gelato mixture is thickening up, which is great. Let's see, sorry, my pasta. It is definitely thickening up. that always stir your spaghetti so it doesn't stick together. Okay, not quite there yet. So I'll show you what this looks like in my, with my gelato. There we go, that is getting a little too hot. You don't want a thin backing to the spoon too thin, you want it actually coating 
and I'll show you what that looks like when it gets there. But it's pretty obvious this mixture has thickened up. And I'm going to pour it in here. So once, if you are using this, and I think I finished that, those instructions, if you are using your glass dish instead, you're going to put that in your freezer for at least four hours. So put it in there and then you can scoop it up, put it into a container, make sure that you seal it so it doesn't get the flavors of your freezer. Okay, so here we go, this is finished now. So you can see it has a nice coating on the back of the spoon. So I'm going to pour this carefully right into my strainer and I'll get any little bits that aren't that I don't want in my gelato. So there's a little bit strain through. There we go. Okay. So let's put this here and get rid of that. So if it's cooked a little much, then you get all the the little bits that you don't want in there. You want it really really, really smooth. So then I'm going to let this, this is really hot. I'm going to let that, whoops, cool off. You could pour it into your, your dish at this point if you want, but it's, it's super hot. So do not put it into your freezer until it is all cooled off. Otherwise that will be a problem. <laughs> you have to always let things cool down, even in your fridge, because it takes all that cold air to then, uh, cool off your um, whatever you're trying to put in there. So this looks fantastic. I'm going to actually show you since this is still, I'm hoping we're going to get to this. Let's see my timer. Well, we have time. Okay. So this looks great. This cream, I think you can see it. I'm going to show you the finished product. So like I said, if I was using this, I would put it in my, if you're using your Gelato maker, you're gonna put it in here when it's cool and then go to town with your gelato maker. And I'm gonna show you what this looks like. I'm praying it's still in here. It is. <laughs> I told my kids, do not touch. So here it is. This is how much this will make that our ingredients today. It comes out like this. It is really, really good. And it's pretty soft still, which is really nice. You can see it scoops pretty easily. Might wanna let it sit out just a tiny bit before you serve it. And this container, I love. It's there, I mean, I'm sure there are others, but I actually got this at the Cook's Nook in Wilton on Route 7. Um, it's really great. They have a couple different top covers. So if you make different gelatos, just make sure you push all that, oops, now that I've, scoop that bit, push all the air out and it keeps it really nicely. I mean, it doesn't have to be honest, it doesn't stick around too long in this house, but when you do have it in there for a few days, it tastes just as fresh as when you made it. So that is our vanilla gelato. Okay, it is getting there. You're finally getting there with our pasta. Okay, so I'm gonna put that back. And this way too, I've actually, even though I have the gelato or ice cream maker, I've actually made it this way as well. And it's just as good. So what I would do is, let me put this over here. Um, what I would do is after the four hours or when it's set, then just take your spoon and scoop it up, put it into your container. It's always best so that the flavor keeps all together, no outside flavors, contaminate your nice gelato and then keep it in that container. So let's see, we have a couple more minutes on this pasta. Okay. And then we will add our eggs and the cheese. Okay. So I'm gonna strain it and put it back. Move some of these things out of the way. They're not too hot. Strainer here. Here you go. Okay. So normally this doesn't take as long <laughs> at the stovetop. Just normal, let's see, 10 to 11 minutes for your 
pasta. I love this brand. You can use, you can use anything you want because there's only a few ingredients. It's really great. I always say if there's only a few ingredients in a recipe, I would try to get the highest quality you can. This also is Rumo pasta. You can find this, I think at, I think they have it at Acme, but for sure at Walter Stewart's, I think the Wilton market, they have this around in quite a few places now. It's really good. In fact, my cousin always turned me on to Barilla pasta. I'm not paid to say any of this, but just sharing my, my thoughts and her thoughts. She lives in Milan, she's Italian. She used to always swear by Barilla, which is also excellent. I'm not, you can still use that, but she says, oh no, now it's Rumo. So anyway, for whatever that's worth, it definitely, I can, I can t definitely taste the difference, but you might want to try it. If you want to venture away, if you use Barilla or any other kind as well, any kind of pasta that you like. Okay. So I think this is just about ready. So Karen, I just want to Again, let everyone know there's been a few questions. First of all, thank you so much. You pack in so many recipes <laughs> in a short hour and we really appreciate it. It's amazing how you get it all done and oh, um, your you. multitasking is outstanding. Uh, secondly, <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to thank um, uh, Diana and some of the participants. They've shared your website. They've shared the oh, recipes on your you. website. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to click on those links in the chat. Um, and again, if you if you wanted to know where the recipes are, also pre appreciate a lot of the chatter. Um, it is in the Zoom email and it's at the very bottom. So if there was anything you didn't uh, catch up on while we were going through all of these amazing recipes, that's where you can find all the information. Um, and lastly, a few people asked us about close-ups and things like that. At our current virtual setup, we only have the one camera. And so we know it's a little limiting, it's virtual, but we are building the new New Canaan Library with the demonstration kitchen. And uh, we do hope to have these events in person, in person with multiple setups. And that we do hope to even possibly as early as the summer, maybe do some offsite events where you guys can actually be a little bit more hands-on. So thanks for your one camera situation. Oh, sure. And also on that note, if anyone has any questions whatsoever at any time, you can always feel free to email me um, or contact me through my website. I know it is, it's a little hard. So I've strained the pasta <laughs> in the meantime. I'm going to put that back on. Um, and if you need a close up shot, I'm happy to send. Sometimes I do do that on my on the website, but I'm also happy to do that or to send to you, Sam, if um, you know people want that, happy to go ahead and do that as well. Because I know sometimes when it's you want to see the step by step, it's it's a uh, little nicer to see it closer up. But but yes, hopefully we'll be in the li new library soon. So so that's a good thing. So I am coding now. This is finally cooperated. I am coding my spaghetti with that pancetta mixture. I'm just gonna make sure that's all coated. And my burner's kind of hot at this point, so I'm keeping it just off a little bit, but so you can see, otherwise I'd have it over on another burner. And you can just reheat this a little bit because I'm going to add, probably okay. I'm going to add my two eggs at this point and the two egg yolks. So you do definitely want to make sure that when you do this, it is, they're thoroughly combined. So go ahead and make sure thoroughly combined. And then you're gonna add your cheese. And the cheese, I suggest adding slowly because you don't want it to clump. If possible, it's nice and hot. You just keep, keep stirring it but when you add it slowly, it prevents the clumping. So it should be totally fine. I'm gonna add a little bit in here as we speak in those eggs, get that in there. And the two egg yolks. This looks so amazing. I think I'm gonna have to take this over to, I don't know, fire department, <laughs> someone, cause my kids are at school today. So this is, there's too much, too much for me. 
I am looking forward to the future when I can make little samples for everyone and we are together at the library. So yoke in here. And there are lots of great farms where you can get really fresh eggs if you want to, if you're making this. I mean, of course they are cooked, that pasta is hot, but if you're nervous, you can definitely find fresh, fresh eggs. And in fact, we were laughing. I was in Italy this last summer and making gelato and some other dishes. And there was actually a, a little feather attached to the egg. <laughs> it was really funny. So we knew it was super fresh. <laughs> so sometimes you can still find that, but there's some great, but here we go. It's starting to look so good. And that is blended really nicely. Yeah, there's a lot of great farms. We went to one the other day, Ambler Farm in Wilton that has great uh, maple syrup. They had a whole presentation and they have eggs. So I've added that kind of slowly, whoops. That's gonna... And then I would just put this back on the burner to kind of reheat it. But this looks and smells amazing. So this, like I said, you can swap out Pecorino if you don't like the flavor for some people it's a little it's a little stronger if you prefer the Parmesan, that's okay too, but this is great. So I'm gonna put this, I'm gonna plate it so you can see it. There we go. And let's see, there is a special way to actually present it. I can probably show you that if we have, let's see if I can find my tools. I don't know if I can find them in time, but. Maybe I'll do that if I'm making a pasta next time. I'll show you how to how to plate your pasta so it's really really pretty. And you know what? Someone mentioned the close up. I'm going to show that on. I'm actually going to do that on my website so you can see. There we go. So this is just such a great great easy dish. Once your pasta boils, it's really fantastic and the flavors are incredible. So. I hope you all get to try these. If you have any questions, like I said, feel free to email me and yeah, I hope you enjoy. Um, that was outstanding, Karen. Thank you so Thank much. You. I cannot believe how much you can show us in such a short hour. <laughs> um, there are people saying, thank you. We have a couple of questions. Can sure. you use prosciutto for the pancetta? And if you could remind, uh, remind us the two brands of pasta you recommended. The two, I'll do the pasta first. Um, so the two brands, Barilla, I actually have, well, Rumo is the first one. I'll show you Rumo is just, it's just like a, a little bit a cut above. <laughs> but Barilla honestly is, I still love Barilla. I have about, oh gosh, I don't know, eight cartons of different things, <laughs> all Barilla. So, I mean, this is excellent. You can't go wrong. I'm just, just a suggestion for my cousin. I've started to use Rumo, but. They're both really, really good. Um, and oh, for prosciutto, it's the problem with prosciutto is it's dried. So it's not gonna offer that fat. You could add it in there, but it would be mostly for just the color, you know, to add a little bit of color. You might have a little flavor, but the pancetta really gives it such a strong, not strong, they complement all the, the flavors together, but a stronger flavor, let's say, than the prosciutto. So. I would definitely try to find, you are gonna be cooking the, the pancetta. So it's just like bacon. When you fry it, like lightly, I just saute it, sorry, just saute it in the olive oil to begin with, it's going to be cooked. It's just crispy. And then of course you're adding everything to it. So it's really good. So try it, if, if you're okay with it, try it. And I hope you enjoy. Thank you so much. We have a lot of people sharing their appreciation and sharing uh, resources with each you. other. Please <laughs> go to newcanaanlibrary.org. Karen will be back next month to show us the cuisine of Northern Italy. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Thanks. everyone. Everybody have a great day. <laughs>